Oh, the struggle is real, right? Anybody ever feel like that at night, just tossing and turning? I was like that last night. I could not sleep. I was so nervous to talk to you guys today. No, I'm just kidding. It, it was fine. But no, we, we, the struggle is real, guys, and we've been talking about that over, over the last three or four weeks of, of different things in our lives that have uh, caused us to, to have some kind of pain or issue or struggle in our life. And uh, I just got to say, like, over the last three weeks um, and during this series, like, I felt uh, very encouraged. I felt very um, just blessed by these different messages that have really challenged me um, to be more like Jesus and to, to kind of open up about what my different struggles are. It's just been, been really, really great. And so we've seen so many people um, over, over the time of, of this series just really come forward and just say, man, I, I have a struggle with this or I'm dealing with that. And they've just been really honest about what's been going on in their hearts and lives. They've just been willing to, to share that. Um, but on top of that, they've just been so excited because they're just sharing how Jesus is helping them overcome their different struggles that they're having in life. It's just been so much fun um, to be a part of. And I think that one of the most impactful things um, about this series is the fact that we're actually sharing um, our struggles. See, a lot of times what we like to do is bury the struggle. Like we don't, we want to put our best face on. We don't want to admit that we have problems. We don't want to admit that there's issues going on in our heart. But what this series has done has just, has just allowed us to be honest with our hearts and say, you know what, I'm dealing with this or I'm, I'm dealing with that, whether it's a temptation or a comparison or whatever. We're just admitting that we have struggles and we're just allowing people to come into our lives and just help us carry those different struggles. And ultimately, you know, we're seeing Jesus just really transform um, many Many people's hearts um, as a result of, of what's been happening over the last few weeks. And I, I love series like this um, for the simple fact that I feel like when we're, when we're talking about real life things and we're kind of getting to, to real life issues, um, I really feel like when people acknowledge that and are open and honest about that, you can kind of get a front row seat to see God do something really special in, in a person's heart and life. Like just really amazing to see uh, God do what God does best. That's just heal people. That's to, to restore brokenness in people. And God has been doing that in, in, in this series over the last few weeks. It's just been a dynamic place um, to be a part or, or a dynamic series to be a part of. And I just, I've loved it so, so much. And so uh, today I, I want to continue on, on the uh, series hashtag struggles. And I want to talk about something that, that I've never really preached a message on, uh, but I think it's a really profound topic. I want to talk about a rest. Because I think rest is really, really super important, but I don't think, you know, we talk about it a lot. And I don't think we value rest a whole lot. Like, we live in a very fast-paced, super busy culture, super busy society where it's just nonstop all the time. Like, the world is literally at your fingertips, and you can literally do whatever you want to in just a matter of seconds. It's super busy. And, and even when we get some time off of work or time off of, you know, school or whatever, uh, we always tend to keep our mind busy, tend to keep our mind focused on other things. So, what what we do is we grab our phones, we'll grab our tablets, our devices, our laptops, whatever, and we'll hop on our favorite media or our social media stream, whether it's uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and we want to find out what's happening because we think we're missing out on something. So, like, I don't think that's necessarily work. Like, just to be honest, I'd rather be on Facebook or Twitter than go like shingle someone's house. Like, but that's not the same thing as work, right? Like, I don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's work, but I don't necessarily think it's rest either. But we always have these different things to keep our minds busy and just to just to not really rest at all. It's almost like we're scared um, to have any downtime. And so I think, I think you know, being on social media, different things, is really something that can, can steal rest from a lot of us. Now, the technical def definition of rest is to cease from work or movement so you can restore yourself, you can relax, and you can recover strength. Like, doesn't, doesn't that sound great? Like, when you can just rest, you can relax, and you can recover, and you can refresh. Like, I think that sounds awesome. I'm, I'm in. I'm game. Let me, let me have these things. But how many of us have driven ourselves to the place of stress or unhappiness or anxiety, maybe even burnout. Like you're at the, at the verge of a breaking point in your life because you haven't taken time to rest. I think a lot of us in the room are probably struggling with that. Maybe this week is just like, man, I've been crazy busy all week and I haven't had any downtime. Well, hopefully this, this message you know, finds, finds you well and, and you can be blessed uh, by this, by this uh, next few minutes together. Um, over the past few weeks, we have been looking at, at the life of a guy named Jacob. And we find Jacob's story pick up in the book of Genesis. Um, and, and so that's the first book in the Bible. So if you have a Bible, you know, flip to Genesis chapter one. That's the first book. About 20 chapters into it or so, you start reading about this guy 
name Jacob. And, and we've been talking about him in detail over the last few weeks. And he's certainly uh, lived a fascinating life. Like, he's, it's just been crazy, right? He, he wrestled uh, with his twin brother inside of his mother's womb. I think that's crazy. I know a lot of, uh, I have a, a, some twin friends. I have some twin family members. It's never come up at the family reunion how, how uh, Ken and, and Greg always fought each other in, in their mother's womb. Like, that's never ha- happened at our family reunion. I think that's crazy. Um, Jacob also married a couple sisters. Uh, probably equally as crazy as, as wrestling in your mother's womb, as, as marrying two ladies. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what, what Jacob was thinking there. Um, obviously, we talked about that last week. He, 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 that, was, that was crazy. He was also chased by his twin brother, Esau, all over the countryside because Jacob had tricked Esau, stole his birthright, uh, a birthright, stole his blessing. And so now Esau was super mad at Jacob because Jacob was a deceiver. So now he's trying to kill him. Jacob lived an exhausting Crazy busy, super busy life. Like Jacob was all over the place, right? And, and, and to say Jacob was probably exhausted is an understatement. Just think about like 80 years of conflict and turmoil and stress and anxiety in the life of Jacob. It was just madness. It was complete madness. And I would say that I can relate to Jacob on a lot of levels. There are some levels that I can't, all right? I've never wrestled with my twin brother inside my mom's womb. Like that does, that's not happened. I, in fact, I don't even have a brother. Um, I've never married twin sisters before. I've never had sister wives, right? I've never had that in my life. I've only got one. I'm happy with that. It's great. It's awesome. I love my marriage. I love my wife, right? So I can't relate to Jacob on everything, right? But I can relate to to Jacob in the fact that, man, this dude was exhausted. This dude was worn out. Like this guy was to the point of breakdown. Like this guy was to the point of just losing it because he was so exhausted and so tired. So I can relate to that. And I don't know if you guys have heard or not, uh, but my wife Amy and I, we were married um, when we were very young. I was not 15, like I was, I was an adult, like I was, I was 19, um, Amy was 18, but we were still very young. And so during that, that first couple years of marriage, um, it, it, was, it was busy, like it was crazy busy. And so what was, so our, our schedule um, kind of looked like this. So I was in school, so I would go to school from 8 to 12, then I would come home and I would go to work from 3 to 11. So I was working a second, what we call a second shift at that time. So I would get up at 7 o'clock, leave by 7.30, be home by 12.30, leave at 2.30 to get to work on time. That was our first like, couple years of marriage. All right, and so that, that, that lasted for a little bit. Like, that was busy. We felt the weight of it. It was super chaotic, super hectic. You know, but we're, like, we were managing. Like, we were able to, to kind of balance our schedule a little bit. Like, it was tough. It was hard. But you just kind of get through one day at a time. You just kind of make it until, um, until something changes, right? Well, something changed. About a, a few months later, we found out we were pregnant. We found out we were having our first boy, Noah. So now, I'm a, I'm a brand new dad. I'm still a brand new husband. I'm still working full time. And I'm still going to school full time. So it actually, in totality, it took me about six years um, to complete my, my degree. So like, it took me a really long time. So like, it was crazy busy. Well, it got a little more complicated because a couple years down the road, we had two more kids. So now I have three boys. I'm still going to school full time. I'm still working full time, raising three boys, still trying to figure out how to be a husband. Like I'm still trying to figure that out, right? Like it was just crazy busy. And so when I say I'm working full time, I'm working 56 to 60 hours a week plus uh, whatever school time was for, for that week. It, it lasted hours sometimes. You guys have been in college. You know what that's like. Like, it just took forever. Plus being a dad, plus being a, married, uh, a newly married man. Like, it was crazy, crazy busy. You know, in, in the meantime, like on the weekends and different weeks, I was getting invitations from different churches to go speak either at a youth function or a weekend uh, revival meeting or a week-long revival meeting. So, like, I was busy ministry-wise, too, trying to, to preach the gospel and, and preach in, in, in the state of Indiana, also in different states across the country. Like, I was, it was just, it was madness. It was just crazy. And, you know, during that time, we really felt like God was kind of calling us into, like, a pastoral role somewhere. Um, we didn't know what that looked like for our family. We didn't know exactly how that role would look, whether it be a senior pastor position or a youth pastor or an associate. Or we didn't really know what God wanted to do. And so um, it, was, it was just crazy busy. And so about a couple months after we had been praying um, about what God wanted us to do in ministry, uh, I became a um, bivocational pastor of a growing church. So basically what that means is I was now working full time, all right, 60 hours a week. I was now pastoring full time. I was still going to school full time. I was trying to learn how to be a dad and still trying to figure out how to be a husband as a newlywed. Like, it was, that's where my life was, okay? That was just, it was bonkers. It was just absolutely crazy. And so, like, we did, we did that hot and heavy on that schedule for, for about three years. Like, really, that schedule, week in, week out, that's what we did um, as a family. And, you know, when you're in it, 
Like you don't really, you don't really, like you feel the weight of it, like you feel the weight of your schedule, but like you kind of take it one day at a time, right? You're just trying to manage it. Like just, I I, I remember saying this a lot, if I could just get through this meeting, then, then, then it'll be better. If I could just get through Wednesday night, then it will be, be better. If I could just get through my Saturday morning meeting, that'll be better. If I could just get through Sunday, that'll be better. Like I remember saying that a lot, like if we could just get through. Like it's just, it's just crazy that we were, we were in that point, like looking back, like I, it was just a completely um, dysfunctional way to live for my family. It was just, it was just insane, it was bonkers. And then the third year of, of my pastor at this church that was, that was growing, we were trying to figure out you know, what we wanted to do. The church uh, called us to be the full-time pastor um, of the church. So they, they, they wanted us to leave, me to leave my, my secular job. So I was now re- being relieved 60 hours a week of working in the secular field so I could focus strictly on you know, moving the church forward and, and being a dad and being a husband. And that was a huge blessing for my family. Like that, was, that was awesome. But what I found out was I was taking those 60 hours a week that I was investing in secular field, and now I was just turning around and investing that in other areas of my life like the church and, and in my other job that I had. Like that, it, it was happening. So like it wasn't uncommon. Like there were times that I was... I would go to the office at eight o'clock in the morning and I would not leave until sometime after midnight the next morning. Like it was, it was not uncommon for me to do that. So like I was just taking one area of stress and shifting it to another area of stress. And like I was just, it was just crazy. I was working a very unhealthy amount of hours during that season of my life. Like it was, it was just crazy. You know, I think one of the, there was a, there was some heavy consequences that I think, you know, we paid as a result of that, number one, you know, I felt like you know my my relationship with my oldest son Noah was kind of deteriorating. Like I felt like he was closer to other men in my family than he was to myself. That was hard for me to deal with. Like looking, there was one instance where Noah actually had to go to the hospital for some respiratory issues, and I remember uh, my dad actually coming to visit him, and he was more clingy and wanted to be with my dad more than he wanted to be with me. And like I remember having a hard time with that. Like, no, like I'm your dad. Like you should want me, but but I was so distant and so disconnected from family because of how much I was working and how busy I was that it just, it just wasn't going to happen. Now, through the grace of God, we've been able to uh, kind of bridge those gaps and really redeem that relationship, but then it was, it was really, really hard. And I think, so that, that was consequence number one. I think a second consequence that was happening in my life during that time was I really feel like God was distant. Like, I really feel like I could not hear God's voice, like, on a personal level. Like, God, what are you trying to say to me? Like, I felt like I was missing out on a chance to hear God's voice in my life. Like, I, I believe God was with me the whole time. I don't ever feel like God neglected me or left me. I think he was with me the whole time. But I think I was at a place in my life where I just could not hear God speaking to my heart and, and hear God speaking to my family. So we were talking about Jacob a little bit ago. I think, I think the same thing was happening in the life of Jacob. Right? During the whole season of Jacob's life, right? He's marrying sisters. He's, he's deceiving his brother. He's running from his brother who wants to kill him. Like all this thing, he's deceiving his father like for, for, for the blessing and birthright. All these different things uh, were happening in the life of Jacob. There was very little mention of God actually speaking to his heart and Jacob actually hearing what God was saying. You know, Jacob was so busy with all these different things of deceiving and stealing and running, he never stopped to listen to the voice of God because he was so distracted, he was so busy that he just couldn't hear it. I believe God was trying to say things to Jacob the entire time, but I just think Jacob just couldn't hear it. He was too busy. You know, I love that we can look at the story of Jacob. I love that we can look at my story, and we can just learn from these different examples that we have because we can learn that if we consume ourselves with too much busyness and so much distraction that we're gonna have a hard time hearing God's voice. It was a great reminder for me looking back at the story of Jacob. And I gotta say, like the moments that I feel like I was the most distant from God, like the moments like I was like, man, God, are you here? God, are you with me? I can't feel you like I used to or whatever, whatever I would say at the time. Like I, I still hear that now in my position. Like so many people come to me and say, I just can't hear God's voice. I don't know if he's with me. I just can't feel God. And I would say, for me in particular, the moments that I have felt the most distant from God was the times that I just was too busy to hear his voice in my heart. Like I, he was with me. He was trying to speak, but I was too busy, right? I was all about the bottom line. I was all about production. I was all about moving things forward and, and producing. Like that was all it was about. And God was like trying to speak to my heart, but I was just too busy to hear so we come to a place in Jacob's life when he finally stops running. He finally stops deceiving and he just gets some rest. And I think this is kind of a turning point in the life of Jacob. 
Like this is, this is where his heart really began to change. It really had a turn uh, from, 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 from his problems, from his stress, whatever. And now he's focusing on the Lord. So we read this in Genesis 28, 11. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. Finally, everyone can say finally, Jacob finally got some rest. It was over. Like he, he finally got to a place where he had to rest. After all the running, after all the deceiving, after everything that happened in his life, Jacob finally rests. And this is when things begin to change in the heart of Jacob. Because what happens next is pretty spectacular. I, th- I think this is great. I think Jacob laying, find, finding a stone to lay his head on as a pillow to rest is awesome. But I think what God did next is pretty spectacular. So, so the story goes on to say that as Jacob was sleeping, God began to speak to him in this really special way, this really profound and, and powerful way. So Jacob is there sleeping, he's lying on the stone, and next thing you know, he's having this dream, and God is actually speaking to him. He says, Jacob, the land that you're sleeping on, the land that you're laying on right now, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna bless you with this land. He says, Jacob, also, I'm gonna give you so many descendants. I'm gonna give you so many uh, people in your family that you're not even gonna be able to count them. Like, they're gonna be like sand on the seashore. Like, you just are not gonna be able to number them. Also, Jacob, I wanted to give your, your, your descendants a, a blessing that's going to bless the entire earth. He said, all, of, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of your legacy. Then he goes on to say, Jacob, everything that I promised, everything that I said, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna fulfill it. So Jacob is hearing God in this really special way because he took time to rest, right? He's, he's taking time to just stop and just listen to the voice of God. There's something that I, that I wanna say here before we go further into the narrative uh, of the story. First of all, I wanna just talk a little bit about who Jacob was as a person, right? Let's think about this. Jacob was a liar, all right? Jacob was a trickster, Jacob was a deceiver. In fact, his name means heel grabber. Jacob was not a good guy. He was not a good dude. And yet God is giving him all these incredible promises. Jacob, I'm gonna give you land. Jacob, I'm gonna give you legacy. Jacob, I'm gonna give you descendants. And of your legacy, the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And Jacob, I am going to do what I promised. Jacob was not a good guy. He was not a good dude. And so as I was reading that, the Lord just kind of reminded my heart, reminded, reminded me of saying, Isaiah, I love to take the misfit and I like to turn it into a masterpiece. I love to take things that are broken and I like to fill it with blessedness. God loves to take things that are broken and fix it and take the misfit and turn it to a masterpiece. And God was not looking at what Jacob had done. God was looking at what Jacob was going to be. So I know there are people in the room who are running from a broken past and just like thinking, man, I've gone too far for God. But I want you to know you are exactly what God wants. He wants you just like you are. He wants you right where you're at. And he wants to take the misfit fit and turn it into a masterpiece because that's what God did with Jacob. And that's why I love we say uh, what we say here at First Church, that no one is perfect and everyone is welcome because that's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God that we have. He likes to take the misfit and turn it into a, a masterpiece. And a lot of times we believe the trick of the devil and he says, this is the best it's gonna be. But God says, the best is still yet to come. The best is still yet to come. So there are, I think there are people in the room who are still stressed, still running, still trying to find that. And I want you to know that God is pursuing your heart and he's telling you that the best is yet to come. So Jacob had this really incredible dream. God is speaking to him in a really powerful way. He's, he finally took some time to just rest and listen to the voice of God. Just take a breather, just, just take a sigh of relief. And finally Jacob says this after he has this interaction with God. It says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. Now I think that's a profound and very powerful statement. So we can see for the first time in the heart of Jacob that he was saying, I was so busy and so worried about my life and the different stresses and different things that were happening. And I was so worried about that that I didn't even know that God was with me or even speaking to me. He says, you were with me, the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. He was recognizing that as a result of unrest in his life, he was missing out on hearing God's voice. The Lord was there, right? I believe God was with me in my, my chaos, my hectic time of life, but I wasn't aware of it because I was too busy. I was too busy with my own things and, and making sure I, everything was moving forward. It's so interesting to me and so relatable to me that he says, I wasn't even aware of it. 
I, I really love the fact in this passage you're able to see like the change of heart in Jacob because of what, what had happened when he finally actually got some rest. He slowed down long enough to hear from God. He says, the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't aware of it. And this kind of takes me to my, my first and basically only point of the talk. It says, when you rest, you will hear God speaking to your heart. All right, when you rest, you will hear God speaking to your heart. That's a promise. I believe that with all my heart. And I would say that a lot of people in the room today are missing out on a moment of hearing God's voice because of the lifestyle you've been living, right? You've been, been so busy, all about producing, all about numbers, and all about production in the bottom line that you've just not heard God speaking to your heart. But I, th- I believe when you rest, you will hear God speaking to your life in a powerful way. And there's a complete change in Jacob from that moment. In fact, Jacob was so impacted by that moment, they actually took the stone that he was sleeping on, raised it upright, and made a pillar, made a monument, so he would remember the fact that God spoke to him in that moment. He never wanted to forget what God did in that moment in the heart of, of Jacob. Like, so when I was a kid growing up, the, the different churches and different preachers would call this a landmark. And they always, all the preachers that I grew up with had southern draws, and they would say, brother, when you get tired, Go back to the landmark. Amen? They would say things like that. When the devil's on your back, brother, go to the landmark. Amen? They don't say amen after they would make a point like they were trying to get some reaction from the crowd, right? Like, that's what would happen. Like, so I heard a ton of messages on the landmark. But I remember, like, I, I, it just made so much sense to me after listening and reading and, and kind of understanding the, 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 the life of Jacob that Jacob did the same thing. Like, he, was, he wanted to always remember the fact that, hey, like, I know, like, it could be crazy tomorrow, but right now I'm resting and I'm going to remember the fact, what, the, the fact that God did something in my heart in a really, uh, like, powerful way. Like, Jacob was remembering that. I think a lot of times we have landmarks in our life that we have to go back to. Yeah, I, I remember the time. Like, we call it a testimony here, right? I remember the time God changed my life. I remember the time that God spoke to my, to my soul or, or whatever it is. Like, we have those different landmarks in our life. But man, what a difference a nap can make, right? Like, Jacob was, was crazy busy, and now he had, he had a moment to rest, and it absolutely changed his life. You know, I kind of want to hop back to the story um, that I shared with you guys about my own personal life earlier. Um, so about three or four months after uh, becoming the full-time pastor of the church Amy and I were serving in, uh, we decided to go on vacation. So it had been, again, three or four years of just hot and heavy, like just crazy busy, work full-time. You know what, you, you guys heard, you know, what, you know what it's all about. Like it was, it was a long time coming. And so we're like, hey, we need to go on vacation. We just need to get away, like we just need to rest. We just need to spend some time away. Because I, I had gotten to a place in my life, in my family's life, where we were a lot like Jacob. We were just tired. We were like on the verge of, of breakdown. Like we are on the verge of burnout. We are on the verge of just losing our minds because we're so tired and we're so busy. There's no end in sight. And we just, we just need to rest. We just need to rest. And so that's what we did. We took one week and we were just committing ourselves to unplug. So we didn't write messages I didn't make any meetings. I think I sent one text to see how things were back home. But other than that, it was just resting. It was just resting. And so one of the things that I really took advantage of during that week was just, I was just going to press into my Bible. Like God speaks to us through his word. Like I wanted to hear God speaking to my heart. So I just started to read his Bible. Just, God, what do you want to say to me? Like, you feel distant, and I want to feel you in my life like I've never felt you before. Like, I want to feel, like, your spirit afresh in my soul. How can I get that in my heart? So one verse that came uh, uh, to, to, to my mind during that week was Psalm 62.1. It says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. So God was speaking to me through his word, and I come across this verse, and God is like, Isaiah, If you want rest, if you want to hear me, if you want to feel me like you've never felt me before, you need to listen to what I'm trying to say to you because your rest is only found in me, right? So I was trying to find rest in the number. I was trying to find rest in the production. I was trying to find rest in the bottom line. I was trying to gauge my my rest on on all these different things. And God was telling me the whole time, your rest is found in me. Your salvation is found in me. God began to speak to me in a really powerful way. Uh, During that week also, I I began to read this book called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. This was a profound book for my life. 
It was written by a guy named Paul Tripp. He's a kind of a pioneer in the biblical counseling movement and just is a fabulous communicator and a great pastor. It's so like I, I, I dug into this book and God really blessed me when I read this quote here. It says, in all of this, God's ultimate goal is his own glory. Christ came to restore people to the purpose they were made for, to live every aspect of their lives in worshipful, obedient submission to him. And this last sentence is the one that really kind of just really blew me away. It says, he accomplishes this by breathing life into dead hearts so that we grasp our need of him. And God really moved in my heart when I read that quote. Like I had this incredible visual of God taking a heart that was barely beating, that was barely alive and just infusing life into it. It's because before I was so busy, I was so like so crazy consumed in everything that was happening around me, I couldn't hear God speaking into my heart. And when God can't speak to our hearts, our hearts begin to fade and fade and fade. And that's what's happening to my heart. It was happening to my heart. I was, God was distant. I was, I, was, I was actually running away from God, but God got a hold of my heart and he started breathing life into a dead heart. And he made, he made me understand that. Listen, Isaiah, you need me. You need me. You don't need the number. You don't need the next message. You don't need the next leader on your team. You don't need anything. You need me. That's what God was saying to me. He said, your rest is found in me. And God says, Isaiah, your heart is barely beating because you've made it all about yourself. You haven't made this about me. It's been all about how you can be fulfilled in these different areas. And God says, no, no, no. You need to grasp your need of me. I need to breathe life into you. From that moment on, from that week on, that was a kind of a turning point with me and my family. Uh, I really feel like my relationship with Jesus has, has been so much better since that week. That was about five years ago, six years ago, something like that. But my relationship with God has been really, really impacted and changed because of that week, because of this book, because of that verse of scripture, because of the Bible ministering to my heart. And so from that moment on, my family and I have taken, and we have always practiced the discipline of taking at least one day a week, at least one day a week to just rest, right? We're not, we're not planning anything. We're not working at all. We are just resting. We're just going to enjoy being with each other, enjoy the blessings that God has given us. Man, I thought, you know, as a church, as, as a body of people here today, I thought, what if we could all just take one day a week to just rest? Just take one day a week on a week level. Guys, listen, we don't have to go on vacation to find what I found. Like, my, my moment was Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, 2012. Like, that was my moment, all right? Jacob's moment was, a, was an overnight trip on a rock on the top of a mountain. Like, you don't have to go on vacation to find what Jacob found, right? You just gotta, you just gotta commit to, to resting and hearing from God's voice. So whatever that looks like in your own life, it's gonna be different for everybody. But I think if we could just take one day a week to just rest, God, I'm just gonna listen. I'm just gonna listen to you our lives will be completely changed. And I know there's a lot that's trying to steal our time from us, you know, whether it's sporting events or jobs or family functions or, or social media or whatever it is. I, I know that's happening in our life. But I thought, man, what if we could just do a couple things to find rest? What if we could just unplug? Let's just unplug from social media. Let's unplug from technology. Let's just unplug for a little bit and just enjoy what God's doing. Just unplug. Whatever that looks like for your context, just unplug from it for one day a week. I promise you guys, you're gonna be impacted forever. It's gonna bless your life. And then what, what, if, what if we could do one more thing? What if we could just press into God's Bible? What if we could just press into God's word? God, I know you wanna to speak to me. I know you have something to say to my heart. What if I could just get in your word? You know, what if I could find my Psalm 62.1, right? What if I could find my instruments in the Redeemer's hands? What if I could find that for my own heart? And God, you could just speak to me in a really profound and special way. I know this is gonna be difficult for some of you guys. I know it's gonna be hard. I think the number one competitor that you're gonna to have to deal with is your guilt for wanting to rest, right? I think people feel bad when they have some downtime. Like I, if I'm not producing, if I'm not moving things forward, then, then I, I don't have any purpose. Like what's, what's my purpose for, right? What am I doing? But I think if we could just take one day a week to rest, guys, you're gonna be blessed. And I want you guys to know, you don't have to feel guilty about resting. You don't. This is a discipline given to us, created by God for our benefit. Because check this out, in Genesis 2.2, it says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. This is talking about creation. It says, so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. So listen, guys, this is your permission slip to rest this week, all right? Take Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, whatever it is, that's your permission slip to rest one day this week. Because here's what God did. God made everything, he had. he'd been working all week, right? Men, women, you don't know understand what, you know this. Like, I've just been working all week. But God finally finished his work, he finally finished his creation, and he looked around and he said, 
this is good. This is really good. I'm pretty happy with this. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rest today. I'm gonna rest. I'm gonna celebrate in the fact that I am good and this is all good. And God was like, it's all good. I'm just gonna rest. And I thought, man, what if we could do that one day a week? If we could just sit back and just say, man, this is all good, right? It's all good. Everyone say, it's all good. One day a week, it's all good. God, I'm just gonna rest. My family's good. Yesterday was bad. It was crazy. It was hectic. Tomorrow might be hectic too. I don't know, but today's good. Today, I'm just gonna rest. Today, I'm just gonna enjoy your goodness because God, you still make things good, right? You still make it good. You made creation good. You made us good. And God, we're gonna celebrate your goodness and we're just gonna rest in your favor and your blessing in our life. And guys, you don't have to be guilty. That's your permission slip from God. Just say, it's all good. I'm gonna rest. I know some of you are gonna have our time with that. I know some of you are like, man, like I just don't know about my schedule. I just don't know about my life. Like I got this and that and the other, and I get it. Like I'm with you. I know what that's like. Like you're looking at a recovering over worker. Like you, I know what it's like. I've been there, done that. I know what it's like. I've, I got the t-shirt as the saying goes. Like I got it. I know what it's like. But I remember a passage in, in the New Testament when Jesus said, for everyone who is weary, heavy laden, come to me. I will give you rest. That's what Jesus said. He said, you, you want rest? Come to me. Come to me, right? That quote said, he does this by breathing life into dead hearts. We grasp our need of him. And Jesus is saying, come to me. Now, like every head to bow and every eye to close, I just want to offer a time of invitation. I know you got busy schedules. I know you got things going on in your life that it's hard, it's busy, it's chaotic, it's hectic. I get it. I know what that's like. But if you're at a place in your life like, yeah, I just, I just want rest in my life. I just, want to, I just want to hear from God in a special way. I want to hear from God like Jacob did. I want to hear from God like Pastor Isaiah did. I want to hear from God in a special way in my life because I'm just going to rest today. If you're just interested in resting and hear from God's voice, just raise your hand and say, yes, I'm acknowledging that I want to rest in God. God bless those hands. I see hands going up everywhere. They're interested in rest. They're, they're tired of the chaos. They're tired of everything that's happening in life. They're just interested in hearing from God. So with your hands still raised, let's just say a prayer together. God, we're coming to you for rest. Jesus gave a great invitation when he said, come to me and I will give you rest. Because God, we're coming to you. We're gonna take you up on your permission to just rest, just to look around and say it's good and God, you are good. We're gonna celebrate the fact that you love us, you created us, and God, our lives could be hectic tomorrow and they could be hectic yesterday. But Lord, right now in this moment, we're just saying it's good. We're resting in you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.